Harper Audio presents Home Alone 2 by Todd Strasser, performed by Tim Curry. On a cold, dark Illinois night, a police car stopped at a railroad crossing. In the back of the patrol car, Marv Merchant's head throbbed. Next to him, his partner Harry Lyme stared angrily ahead. All Marv could think about was that blonde-haired McAllister kid grinning and waving as the cops put them into the back of the patrol car. If he ever got his hands on that kid again, he'd... Suddenly, Harry nudged Marv and revealed a lockpick he had hidden in his hand. Marv grinned. While the cops sat in the front seat, Harry picked the car door lock and the two bad guys quietly slipped away. That night, Kevin McAllister stayed up late cleaning his house. Without warning, the door burst open and there stood Harry with a nasty grin on his face. Marv was reaching for Kevin's throat. Merry Christmas, little fella, Harry chuckled. Kevin was still home alone, and these guys wanted to carve him into little pieces. It was time to run. You're all out of tricks, kid, cried Marv. Maybe not. Kevin dashed out the back of the house and into the garage. He grabbed the remote garage door opener and then climbed up into the small storage attic above the cars. Outside, Harry ran to the garage door. It was closed, and the handle to open it was missing. As Harry stuck his finger in the hole where the handle used to be, Kevin pressed the automatic door opener. Suddenly, the door began to rise. The next thing he knew, Harry was rising along with the door. In the garage, Marv saw two sneakered feet hanging from the storage attic. Marv grabbed them and pulled. But it wasn't Kevin. It was a child-sized mannequin, and there was a rope attached to it. Suddenly, Marv heard an engine cough to life above him. Marv looked up just in time to see the churning blades of a lawnmower appear above him. It was too late. The lawnmower tipped over the edge and came crashing down. Ah! In a dark cell, Marv Merchin screamed in his sleep and woke up terrified. In a cell nearby... Harry Lyme heard his partner. Harry had also had a nightmare about the McAllister kid. Harry had a plan, and if it worked, both he and Marv would be busting out of this joint in a couple of days. Then they'd have to get some money and leave the country fast. Only one thing could slow them down. Harry's fists tightened. If he ever saw that McAllister kid again... December the 22nd, Oak Park, Illinois, 6 p.m. The ground was covered with a white blanket of snow, and the houses were lit with colorful, twinkling Christmas lights. On the outside, the large brick McAllister house resembled the other stately homes on the block, but inside was a tornado of pre-travel chaos as everyone rushed to pack for their holiday trip. Has anyone seen my sunblock? shouted Tracy, a pretty dark-haired girl. What's the point of going to Florida if you're going to use sunblock? Her younger sister, Sandra, asked. Yeah, chimed Megan. I'm getting tested. So you'll just be a skag with a slightly darker shade of skin, said her older brother, Buzz. Buzz is jealous, yelled Lenny, who was 14 and blonde. Fuller, the youngest member of the McAllister clan, watched the human logjam. Now a chubby, bald man came into the room. He was Frank and he was Fuller's father. That day, he had driven his family to Oak Park so that the McAllister clan could all travel together the next morning. Hey, Frank said, waving a copy of the newspaper. Remember those robbers Kevin caught last Christmas? They just escaped from prison. No one paid any attention, so Frank pushed his way up the stairs. The only member of the McAllister clan who wasn't in a rush was Kevin. He sat on the bed in his parents' room and played with his talk boy recorder while he watched TV. Near him, his mother, Kate McAllister, was busy packing a suitcase. Aren't you nervous about your solo with the children's choir tonight? Kate asked. That's the third time you've asked, Kevin replied. I'm just concerned, his mother said. Are you packed? Yes, Mom. 
Oh, Kate said. I forgot to show you what Grandma sent you for the trip. Kevin rolled his eyes. Donald Duck slippers? Much better than that, Kate said, taking a plastic package out of her suitcase. An inflatable clown for the pool. Just what I always wanted, Kevin groaned. He turned back to the TV. A grand-looking hotel came on the TV screen. Guests of the new celebrity Ding Dang Dong stay at the world-renowned Plaza Hotel. It's New York's most exciting hotel experience. For reservations, call... Now that would be a cool place to go, Kevin thought, as his father Peter entered the bedroom. You better get your jacket and tie on, Peter said. We have to leave for the Christmas pageant in a few minutes. My tie's in my room and I can't get it because Uncle Frank is taking a shower in the bathroom. Just run in and get your tie, Peter said. It's okay. As Kevin left his parents' bedroom, he found his cousin Sondra and sister Megan dragging their suitcases down the hall. Dad said we have to have our suitcases down by the door before we go to the Christmas pageant, Megan, the know-it-all, said. Are you my new mother? Kevin asked. He couldn't stand it when she nagged him. Remember what happened last year? Sandra asked. Kevin felt his teeth clench. He hated the way they all loved to remind him how he'd missed the trip to Paris and ruined the vacation for everyone. Kevin went into his room. He could hear the shower running in the bathroom and Frank singing. Kevin sneaked over to the bathroom door and pushed it open a little. Kevin aimed the talk boy towards his uncle and started to record the terrible off-key singing. Suddenly, Frank noticed him. Get out of here, you nosy little jerk, or I'll come out and slap you silly. Kevin slammed the door, grabbed his tie, and raced out of the room. Didn't anyone have a sense of humor anymore? A little while later, Kevin stood with the children's choir on the stage at his school. Each member of the choir held a small, glowing electric candle. Buzz stood on a riser behind Kevin. In the audience, Kevin spotted his parents sitting next to Uncle Frank and his wife, Aunt Leslie. Down in front of the choir, Ms. Wickersham, the music teacher, smiled and nodded. The choir began to sing. Kevin swallowed nervously. He'd never sung a solo before such a large crowd before. Behind him, Buzz was ticked off. As usual, the little twerp was getting all the attention. Buzz had an idea. He grabbed the candle from the kids singing next to him and smiled. Kevin took a deep breath. This was it, his big solo. He began to sing. A bunch of people burst out laughing. Kevin's ears burned with humiliation. Even the kids in the choir had joined in. Could his singing really be that bad? And why did his ears feel so hot? Suddenly, Kevin turned around. Buzz was holding two electric candles and grinning like an idiot. The big jerk had held his candles behind Kevin's ears, making them glow in the middle of his big solo. Kevin slugged Buzz oh. in the stomach. The big dummy lost his balance and fell into the other kids. The whole choir collapsed like a bunch of bowling pins. Kate McAllister closed her eyes in despair. Why was it always her children who caused the worst scenes? Kevin laid on the fold-out couch and stared up at the attic rafters. How could they ever believe Buzz? He thought angrily. What a bunch of jerks. A moment later, Kate opened the door and entered the room. Kevin ignored her. Your brother Buzz apologized to you, she said. He didn't mean what he said. He was just kissing up to you. I'm sorry, Kevin, but I don't believe that, Kate replied. You've been so negative lately. Now we're all getting on that airplane at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Your father's spending a lot of money to take us all to Florida. When you're ready to apologize to Buzz and the rest of the family... I'm not apologizing to Buzz, Kevin shouted. Then you can stay up here for the rest of the night. Fine, said Kevin. I don't want to be down there anyway. I can't trust anyone in this family. And you know what? If I had my own money, I'd go on my own vacation alone. And I'd have the most fun of my whole life. You got your wish last year, Kate warned him. 
Maybe you'll get it again this year. I sure hope so. Kevin yelled at her. Kate gazed helplessly at her angry young son. She turned and went back down the stairs. Kevin watched her leave. Someday I'm going to go away all by myself. No one will bother me. No one will make fun of me. No one will cause me any trouble. The entire clan was gathered in the living room. Buzz and Kevin sat in chairs facing them. Buzz, you go first, Kate said. Buzz stood up. I want to apologize to all of you for whatever displeasure I caused. And I want to apologize to my brother. My prank was immature and ill-timed. Immature or not, it was pretty hilarious, Uncle Frank said. The other adults glared angrily at him. <clears throat> I can assure you all that there will be absolutely no more shenanigans from me, Buzz continued with the most phony apology Kevin had ever heard. Kate smiled proudly. That was very nice, Buzz. Buzz turned back to Kevin and whispered, Try to beat that, you little trout sniffer. Kevin, Kate said, what do you have to say? Kevin rose and stared at them. Couldn't they see that Buzz was yanking their chains? Well, Kevin thought, I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm not sorry. He said defiantly. I did it because Buzz humiliated me, and since he gets away with everything, I let him have it. He turned to leave. Stop, Kevin, Kate shouted. If you walk out of here, you'll sleep in the attic, his father yelled. Kevin shrugged. So what else is new? The morning sunlight peeked through the bedroom curtains. Kate lay under the covers, dreaming. She was awakened by a loud knocking sound. Hey! Anybody home? A voice shouted. You're going to miss your plane. Plane? Kate thought. Oh, no. She stared at Peter in wide-eyed terror. We did it again! They screamed. A few minutes later, the front door burst open and 14 hastily dressed people dragged their luggage outside and into the two airport vans waiting in the driveway. Everyone present and accounted for? The van's driver asked. Yes, Kate said. Go! The vans roared out of the driveway. Next stop, O'Hare Airport and their plane to Florida. If it hadn't left yet. With five minutes left before departure time, both vans screeched to a stop in front of the American Airlines terminal. People and bags began pouring out of the vans. Hurry, everyone! Peter shouted as the skycaps quickly tagged the luggage and threw it onto baggage carts. The families rushed into the terminal, but Kevin lagged behind. Dad? He tugged at his father's tan raincoat. I need batteries for my talk boy. His father always carried extra batteries in his travel bag. Kevin reached for the bag. Not now, his father said. Come on. Kate tugged him to the doors. Let's go. Wait a minute. Kevin pulled away. I really need batteries. Peter put the bag down took out his wallet and gave the skycap his tip. Kevin waited until his father put his wallet back. Then he quietly took the bag. Peter ran inside and Kevin followed. Keeping one eye on his father's tan raincoat, Kevin unzipped the brown bag. Inside he found a Polaroid camera, his father's wallet, an address book, an envelope filled with cash and a package of batteries. I knew it, Kevin thought. He started to replace the batteries in his talk boy. As Kevin concentrated on putting the new batteries in the talk boy, another man in a tan raincoat started to rush toward his plane. Kevin saw this tan raincoat and followed it. The man hurried through a gate and into a jetway. Wait for me, Kevin shouted. But as he hurried toward the ticket agent, he tripped. Kevin slammed into the ticket agent and the 150 boarding passes she was holding fell to the floor. Gosh, I'm sorry, Kevin panted as he got up. Don't worry about it, the ticket agent said. Are you on this flight? Yeah, Kevin said in a rush. And so's my family, but they're already on the plane. Do you have your boarding pass? It's... Kevin pointed down at the boarding passes scattered all over the floor. All right. Kevin and the ticket agent hurried down the jetway and into the plane. 
Do you see your family? The ticket agent asked. The plane was a wide body, and the aisles were crowded with people. Kevin spotted the tan raincoat. The man wearing it had his back turned. That's my dad. Good, said the ticket agent. Take any open seat and have a merry Christmas. Kevin found a place to sit. He didn't see any familiar faces. That bothered him for a moment, but he decided his family must have been spread around the plane in random seats. Kevin settled back and slipped on the earphones of his talk boy. It was going to be a long, boring flight, and he figured he'd better entertain himself. Not far away, another jet was also pulling away from its gate. In the first-class section, Peter and Kate were still settling into their seats. I never thought we'd make it, Peter said as he sat back. Next to him, Kate bit her lip. Something wrong? Peter asked. I don't know, Kate replied. It's that feeling that you forgot something. It's just bad memories. That's all. We're all here. There's nothing to worry about. Kate smiled weakly and tried to relax. It had been a year since they'd all tried to take a Christmas vacation together. She just hoped this one would go better than the last. As his jet touched down on the runway, Kevin looked up in surprise. The time had really passed quickly. Kevin got his coat and the brown travel bag and walked up the jetway. He waited by the gate and looked for a familiar face. Dozens of people passed, but none of them were McAllisters. Finally, the flight crew came out, pulling their bags behind them. Kevin looked back into the jetway. It was empty. That's weird, he thought. Where's my family? They wouldn't just leave him, not after what happened last year. Through the windows, he could see a city skyline looming in the distance. Suddenly, Kevin felt queasy. He turned to the ticket counter. What city is that back there? He asked the agent. New York, the agent said. New York. Kevin's eyes went wide. I did it again. Kevin was in a state of shock. He walked slowly toward the picture windows. It was unbelievable. His dumb family was in Florida. He was in New York. Gradually, the shock began to wear off. That's right, he thought. Those jerks are in Florida. I'm in New York. A big smile grew on Kevin's face. Hey, this could be great. The McAllister clan stood around the baggage carousel, staring out the windows. They could see a few palm trees and one or two senior citizens, but mostly they saw rain, thick sheets of it pouring down like a waterfall. Great way to start a vacation, Kate said with a sigh. It can get worse, Peter said. The bags were starting to come down the chute. Everybody take their own luggage, Kate shouted. As the first bag came around, Peter picked it up. "Give this to Kevin," he said, passing the bag to Kate, who gave it to Leslie. "Give this to Kevin," Leslie said, giving the bag to Megan. "It's Kevin's bag." Megan handed the bag to Fuller. Fuller turned to give it to Kevin, but Kevin wasn't there. "Kevin's not here," he said, giving Sandra the bag. "Kevin's not here," Sandra said, and gave the bag to Kate, who was busy passing out the other bags. Kevin's not here," Kate said as she handed the bag to Peter. Peter stared at her. "What did you say?" "I said." <sighs> Kate's eyes went wide and she screamed, "Kevin!" The Miami Airport police were housed in a small office near the main terminal. Kate and Peter sat across from an officer named Bennett. "Where did you last see your son?" Officer Bennett asked. "In O'Hare Airport," Peter said. Bennett nodded. "And when did you notice your son was missing, ma'am?" "Um, not until we picked up our baggage here," Kate said. "I see. Has the boy ever run away from home?" "Absolutely not," Peter said. "Has he ever been in a situation where he's been on his own?" "Um." He was left home by accident last year," Kate explained, embarrassed. 
Officer Bennett nodded. We'll call Chicago and notify them of the situation. The odds are that's where he is. It's very unlikely he'd be anywhere else. In the back seat of a taxi cab crawling through traffic, Kevin studied a New York City street map. Central Park was his next stop, but his attention was diverted by a grand-looking hotel. The Plaza Hotel, Kevin said. New York's most exciting hotel experience. Kevin got out of the cab and was just about to cross the street into the park when he saw a woman with long, stringy gray hair and dirty clothes coming toward him. A bunch of mangy pigeons were perched on her head and shoulders and dozens more clustered on the sidewalk around her feet. Ew, sick! Kevin was disgusted and quickly turned away. He could visit Central Park later. Not far away, two other recent arrivals to the Big Apple were taking in the sights. The escaped convicts Marv Merchants and Harry Lyme strolled through bustling Manhattan. Kevin waited in a crowd of holiday shoppers for a traffic light to change. The walk light came on, and Kevin followed the other pedestrians. Across the street, Harry and Marv also stepped off the curb. Seconds later, Kevin brushed past the escaped cons. Suddenly, Harry stopped and turned around. He caught a glimpse of a kid with blonde hair. Nah, he thought. It couldn't be. What's the matter? Marv asked. Harry shook his head. Thought I saw something. Officer Bennett was on the phone. Kate tapped her fingers nervously, and Peter gnawed on his thumbnail. Bennett hung up and shook his head. Sorry, folks. The police at O'Hare haven't seen him. Kate and Peter stared at each other. What if Kevin had been kidnapped? Do either of you have a recent photo of the boy? Bennett asked. I have one. Peter reached for his wallet, but it wasn't there. My wallet's gone. Where could it be? Kate asked. It was in my travel bag. Kevin wanted it at the airport. You think he took it? Kate asked. I bet he did, Peter said. Then he could have your wallet, Bennett said. Were there credit cards in it? Sure, Peter said. We'll notify the credit card companies. If your son uses any of the cards, we'll be able to get a location on him. Kate shook her head wearily. I don't think Kevin even knows how to use a credit card. If Kevin was going to spend his vacation in New York, he'd need a place to stay. So why not try New York's most exciting hotel experience? As he stepped through the huge brass doors of the Plaza Hotel, he could see that this was his kind of place. To the left of the lobby, he found a row of telephones along one wall. Getting the Plaza to accept a reservation from a kid was going to take a bit of ingenuity, but with the help of his talk boy, Kevin thought he could do it. He prepared the talk boy for the call, then dialed the hotel number. As soon as the reservations agent answered, he hit the play button then slowed it down so that his voice sounded deep and mature. Hello, this is Peter McAllister, the father. I'd like to have a hotel room, please, with an extra large bed and a TV. Kevin pressed the pause button. Do you have a credit card, sir? The agent asked. Kevin pressed play. A credit card? You got it. The next thing the agent heard was the account number on Peter McAllister's visa card. A few seconds later, Kevin had his reservation. Next stop, the hotel reception counter. Kevin crossed the lobby. A female clerk stared at him curiously. Her name tag read Ms. Acevedo. Can I help you? She asked. Reservation for McAllister. A reservation for yourself? She asked. Kevin had anticipated that question. Are you serious? Think about it. A kid coming into a hotel and making a reservation? I'm traveling with my dad, Kevin explained. He's at a business meeting right now. He dropped me off here and gave me his credit card. He said you should check me into the room so I don't get into mischief. Kevin slid his father's visa card across the counter and held his breath. 
she seemed to take a long time inspecting it. Finally, Miss Azevedo slid the card into a small machine and imprinted a credit ticket. Then she handed the card back to him. All right. Kevin slid the credit card into his pocket. It worked. Ms. Acevedo called for a bellman. I hope you'll enjoy your stay with us. And when your dad arrives, remind him that he has to come down and sign a couple of things. My pleasure, Kevin smiled. A heavy-set bellman appeared. This way, sir. The bellman picked up the travel bag. Cool, Kevin thought as he followed the bellman. This is great. Kevin smiled as he entered the suite and looked into the bedroom. Inside was a large TV, a minibar with a small refrigerator, and a bed that looked bigger than the one his parents had at home. There is a second door out to the hall from the bedroom in case you want to go out that way, the bellman said. Um, thanks, Kevin replied. You know how the TV works? the bellman asked. I'm ten years old, Kevin said. TV is my life. Of course, the bellman smiled crookedly and left. Rain pelted the windows. The motel room smelled like someone's basement. Sitting on the bed, Buzz stared out the window at the dead palm trees strung with fading Christmas lights. Behind him, Uncle Frank belched and scratched his stomach through his T-shirt. I swear, Buzz, he said, this place sure didn't look this bad when your Aunt Leslie and I honeymooned here. Buzz wished Uncle Frank would disappear. Then, as if a miracle had occurred, Uncle Frank did leave. But a moment later, the door opened again. Buzz? It was his brother, Jeff. What? You're really upset, huh? Buzz rolled his eyes. Very. It's not your fault Kevin's gone, Jeff said as he started to undress. We were all lousy to him, but he'll make it wherever he is. Buzz nodded, but didn't reply. Jeff got into bed and turned out the lights. Try to get some sleep, Buzz. You'll go nuts staring out the window like that. Buzz nodded again, but didn't take his eyes off the window. In a room across the way, there was a gorgeous woman. She'd neglected to pull her shade down. Buzz smiled to himself. He'd have to thank his brother someday. In the room next door, Kate also sat by the window. Peter came out of the bathroom. He looked pale and his eyes were puffy. Anything? Kate shook her head. I called the house. I thought he might be home. Peter slumped down on the bed next to her. We'll just have to keep waiting. Do you think he's okay? Kate's eyes were filled with hope and worry. Peter didn't want to disappoint her, so he nodded. But the truth was, neither of them knew. Kevin was stretched out on the king-sized bed, eating a large hot fudge sundae and watching a black and white gangster tape he'd rented from the hotel. Now this is a vacation, he thought with a big smile. On the TV screen, a shapely woman let herself into a dimly lit room. Hold it right there, a raspy voice ordered. The startled woman gasped. It's just me, Johnny. The lights went on, revealing Johnny, a gangster. I knew it was you, Johnny said. I could smell you getting off the elevator. It's Gordini's, Johnny, Carlotta said nervously. Your favorite. Johnny didn't seem impressed. You was here last night, too, wasn't you? No, I was singing at the Blue Monkey last night. On the bed, Kevin shook his head. Don't listen to her, Johnny. Johnny didn't. No, you wasn't. You was here. That's a dirty, rotten lie, Johnny. Carlotta sounded hurt. Don't give me that. No, no, you got me all wrong. All right, I believe you, Johnny said, reaching down behind his desk and bringing up a black machine gun. But my Tommy gun don't. Johnny, I'm all wool and a yard wide. You are the only duck in my pond. Get down on your knees and tell me you love me. Carlotta quickly dropped to one knee. Baby, I'm over the moon for you. 
Carlotta begged. Johnny shook his head. You gotta do better than that. If my love was an ocean, Lindy'd have to take two airplanes to get across, Carlotta cried. Johnny was quiet for a moment. Maybe I'm off my hinges, but I believe you. That's why I'm gonna let you go. On the bed, Kevin stopped eating. Forget it. She's rat bait. Kevin turned off the TV. Suddenly there was a sharp knock on the living room door. He'd been expecting trouble, and it sounded like it had just arrived. Kevin hopped off the bed, turned off the lights, and ran to the bathroom. He turned on the shower full blast. He made sure his inflatable clown was in position behind the shower curtain, then took the strings he'd attached to the clown's arms and hid behind the sink with his talk boy. Back in the living room, the doorknob slowly turned, and the door opened. A tall man in a dark suit peeked in. He was the hotel concierge, and he was suspicious because the mysterious Mr. McAllister had never shown up to sign the credit card slip. The concierge tiptoed through the living room toward the bathroom door. Kevin pressed play on his talk boy, and Uncle Frank's off-key singing began to fill the room. The concierge looked in. Kevin started pulling on the strings attached to the clown. The concierge saw a shadow moving and pushed the bathroom door open a little more. Kevin made the clown shake one arm angrily. Get out of here, you nosy little jerk, or I'll come and slap you silly. Frank's voice shouted angrily out of the talk boy. The concierge turned and hurried out of the room. Kevin heard the door shut. He came out of his hiding place and went back into the bedroom. He looked around to make sure nothing had been taken. Everything was there. Kevin picked up his father's address book and thumbed through it. Under M, he found McAllister, Rob, 51 West 95th Street, New York, New York. I should pay Uncle Rob a visit, Kevin thought. He usually gives good presents. Kevin looked out the window at the vast, dark New York night. Kevin imagined families being together out there. It was Christmas, and his family was far away in Florida. They may have been wahoos, but they were his wahoos. For the first time, Kevin felt an ache in his heart, and he knew he really missed them. The next morning, Kevin took his time showering and then slowly combed his hair. Kevin was starting to realize that he wasn't crazy about vacationing alone, especially in a place where he didn't know anyone. He would have called his parents, but he didn't know where in Miami they were staying, and even though he had a return ticket to Chicago, there was no sense in going home to an empty house. So he just had to make the best of the situation. A little while later, Kevin went down to the concierge's desk in the lobby. Is my transportation here? Kevin asked. Out in front, sir, the concierge replied. A limousine and a pizza. Compliments of the Plaza Hotel. New York's most exciting hotel experience, Kevin winked and started across the lobby. The concierge stepped over to the reservations counter and started to type some information on the computer. He'd tracked down that kid's credit card. Maybe, just maybe, he could find an answer to this puzzle. In Central Park, Marv and Harry sat on a wooden bench, enjoying their newfound freedom. Harry was reading a newspaper. We gotta face the facts, Harry said. What we need is cash. How about hotels? Marv asked. Tourists carry cash? I got a better idea, Harry said. All the stores are open the day before Christmas, but they ain't gonna make deposits on Christmas Eve. So they gotta keep the cash in the store until the day after Christmas, Marv said. Right. And this is what I had in mind. He pointed down at a large ad in the paper for Duncan's Toy Chest, the world-famous toy emporium. A toy store, Marv gasped. That's brilliant, Harry. Harry grinned. There's nobody dumb enough to knock off a toy store on Christmas Eve. There is now, Marv grinned back. Kevin sat in the red leather seat of the stretch limo as it cruised slowly through the city. He had just finished his pizza breakfast and was watching cartoons on the limo's TV. 
This is the life, he thought. Buzz, if only you could see me now. Kevin glanced out of the window and saw something that made his eyes bulge. Duncan's toy chest. Please drop me off here, he said to the driver. The limo pulled to the curb and the driver hopped out and opened Kevin's door. The driver left and Kevin walked into the toy store. Inside, he stopped and looked around. He'd never seen anything like it. The ground floor was two stories high and every inch was filled with toys. And without a moment's hesitation, he dove right in. Kevin wasn't the only person from Illinois exploring Duncan's toy chest. On the second floor, Marv and Harry stepped out of two large wooden playhouses. Perfect, Harry whispered. Later on today, we come back and hide inside these houses. Tonight, when everybody leaves, we come out and empty the cash registers. Downstairs, Kevin dropped an armful of toys onto the cashier's counter. Since no one was going to give him any Christmas presents, he'd decided he'd have to give them to himself. A portly, red-cheeked old man stood behind the cash register. Kevin pulled out some money. You know, you really have a nice store here, Kevin said. Thank you, the man said. This Mr. Duncan must be a pretty nice guy. Well, he loves kids, the man said, as he placed Kevin's toys in a bag. Actually... He's going to donate all the money the store makes today to the children's hospital. Tonight? Kevin asked. Like on Christmas Eve? He'll leave the money here in the store and take it to the hospital the day after Christmas. That's very generous of him, Kevin said. The thought of sick children really tugged at Kevin. He took out a $20 bill. Give this to Mr. Duncan, he said. The hospital needs it more than me. That's very sweet of you, the man said. He pointed to a miniature Christmas tree adorned with small ceramic figurines. I'm going to let you select an object from that tree. For free? Kevin was amazed. Absolutely, the man said with a smile. Take the turtle doves. Both of them? The man nodded. The turtle dove? represents friendship. You should keep one and give the other to a person who's very special to you. That way, you will remain friends forever. Gee, thanks. Kevin took both turtle doves from the tree. Merry Christmas, the man said. Merry Christmas to you too. Kevin picked up his bag. Then he noticed a framed portrait on the wall. The man in the portrait looked exactly like the man he'd just spoken to. A small plaque said, E. F. Duncan, founder. Kevin looked back, but the man was gone. He looked back up at the portrait in wonder. As Harry and Marv pushed out through the doors of Duncan's toy chest, Harry suddenly stopped and shaded his eyes. I don't believe what I'm seeing. Harry pointed at Kevin who was standing on the sidewalk in front of them, concentrating on his street map of the city. It can't be, Marv gasped. I must be seeing things. No, you ain't, Harry said with a nasty smile. What's he doing here? Let's ask him, Harry said. Kevin turned around and looked up into the faces of the two grungy but familiar-looking men. The shorter man smiled and his silver tooth glinted in the sunlight. Hiya, pal, Harry said. Kevin felt his jaw drop. Ah! Kevin screamed and started to run. Harry and Marv chased after him. Ahead, Kevin saw a street vendor selling fake pearl necklaces. He grabbed some money and bought half a dozen. Kevin put each necklace in his mouth and bit through the string that held the fake pearls. Kevin raced across the pavement and scattered the loose pearls behind him. A second later... Harry and Marv hit the pearls. Whoops! <laughs> Both men flipped in the air and crashed onto the street. For a moment, neither man moved. Kevin sprinted up to the Plaza Hotel and ran up to the concierge. There's two guys chasing me, he gasped, pointing back down the street. The concierge smiled maliciously. What's the problem? A store wouldn't take your stolen credit card. 
The next thing Kevin knew, the concierge took the card from Kevin's pocket and grabbed him by the collar. Oh no, he thought. They're going to arrest me. In a flash, he twisted out of the concierge's grip and ran into the hotel. Stop that child! Now the concierge and the bellman were chasing him. Ahead, Kevin saw Ms. Acevedo step out from the reservations counter to block his path. He went into a baseball slide and slid under her legs. As he jumped up, he saw the concierge and the bellman crash into her and fall into a heap. Kevin ran into the elevator and pressed the up button. Marv and Harry rose stiffly from the asphalt. I can't believe we lost him, Marv groaned. We didn't, Harry said. He went into that hotel, and when he comes out, when we got him. What about his folks? Marv asked. Harry grinned. He ain't with his folks. How do you know? Marv asked. This is New York, nitwit. No parent in the world would let their kid walk around here alone. That's the end of part one. Please fast forward the tape to the end and turn it over. Kevin ran into his suite and locked the door behind him. He went into the bedroom and locked that door too. He could not believe how many things had just gone wrong. It was time to go home. He opened his father's travel bag and took out the return plane ticket to Chicago. Then he took some bags of Doritos from the minibar and packed them into the travel bag along with the Polaroid camera, his father's wallet and the toys he'd bought. Finally, he stuck the talk boy in the pocket of his coat. Suddenly, he heard the elevator doors open out in the hall. It was time to take evasive action. Kevin turned on the television and the VCR and grabbed the remote. The gangster movie started to play just as the door to the living room began to open. Hold it right there, the gangster on the tape shouted. In the living room, the concierge, bellman, clerk and two hotel security guards stopped, surprised by the tough adult voice. Um, it's the concierge, sir, the concierge said nervously. I knew it was you. I could smell you getting off the elevator. While the hotel employee stared wide-eyed at the door to the bedroom, Kevin pressed the mute button and skipped over Carlotta's reply. You was here last night too, wasn't you? The gangster barked. The concierge shook his head. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, but you're mistaken. We're looking for a young man. All right, the gangster replied. I believe you, but my Tommy gun don't. They looked at each other in horror. Get down on your knees and tell me you love me, the gangster demanded. In the bedroom, Kevin hit the pause button and waited. In the living room, the hotel employees slowly sank to the floor. Then the concierge said, Um, I love you. Kevin hit play and the gangster barked angrily. You gotta do better than that. We love you. The terrified hotel employees gasped in unison. Kevin grabbed the travel bag and ran out of the bedroom door to the hallway and disappeared into a stairwell. He ran down the stairs and then out into a service corridor. He burst through the two swinging doors and into a large garage with a truck-loading dock. He ran to the edge of the dock and jumped right into the waiting arms of Harry and Marv. Nice of you to drop in, kid, Harry grinned as he twisted Kevin's arms behind his back. A few minutes later, Kevin found himself walking down Fifth Avenue in the middle of a crowd of last-minute shoppers. Harry and Marv each had a firm grip on one of his arms. Kevin knew his future didn't look bright. These guys definitely planned to do something bad to him. He secretly reached into his coat pocket and pressed the record button on his talk boy. What are you guys doing in New York? Kevin asked. We busted out of the joint, kid, Marv said proudly. At midnight tonight, we're hitting Duncan's toy chest. Then we're going to get us some phony passports. You want to shut up, Marv? Harry snapped. What's the difference? Marv asked. He ain't going to tell nobody, except maybe the fish. Let's just get him down to the subway tunnel, Harry said. I'll feel a lot better when he's on ice. Kevin reached into his pocket and felt for his plane ticket. 
If he could get away from these guys, he'd get the first plane home and never come back to New York again. Hey, what's this? Marv suddenly grabbed Kevin's hand and pulled it out of his pocket. Marv yanked the ticket out of Kevin's hand and read it. One round trip ticket to Miami, Florida. Hey, I think the squirt must have gotten on the wrong plane. His family's probably in Florida, Harry said. Yeah, Marv laughed and ripped the ticket into little pieces. You won't be needing this no more, little dude. American Airlines don't fly to the promised land. Kevin watched the torn pieces of the ticket flutter to the sidewalk. Now what was he going to do? He saw a policeman up ahead, but Harry squeezed his arm. I got a gun in my pocket, Harry whispered. You open your mouth to that cop and you'll be able to spit gum out through your forehead. Kevin didn't have a chance as they walked past the policeman. Back in the crowds again, he felt the bad guys loosen their grip on his arms. This might be his last opportunity. An attractive woman in a white fur coat was in front of them. Kevin reached forward and pinched her. She spun around to face Marv and made a fist. Marv smiled. As Marv tumbled backward, he let go of Kevin's arm. Kevin quickly turned and socked Harry in the stomach with all his might. The bad guy instantly dropped to his knees. Kevin stared at his little fist in amazement. Then he grabbed the brown travel bag and took off across the street, leaving Marv on his back and Harry on his knees. Where's the kid? Marv groaned. Headed for the park, Harry grimaced. He hit me in the ulcer. Marv helped Harry to his feet and they ran into the park looking for Kevin. We should have shot him when we had the chance, Harry grumbled, looking around at the trees and joggers. Marv said, he's alone and he's in the park and it's going to be dark soon. Grown men come in here and don't get out alive. Yeah, Harry started to grin. Good luck, little fella, he shouted and then turned to Marv. I think it's time we pay Duncan's toy chest another visit. Curled up in the storage box behind a hansom cab, Kevin heard Harry's shout. A long time passed. Finally, he peeked out. The sky was grey and the park was dark and cold. He climbed out of the box, hugged himself and shivered. He was alone, without a place to stay, without a way to fly home or to Miami or any place else. And it was Christmas Eve. I want to go home, he sniffed. Mom, where are you? The rain poured down relentlessly. Kate sat in the motel room staring at the phone. It rang and Kate grabbed it. Yes? It's Officer Bennett, ma'am. We've located your son. Oh my gosh! Kate shook Peter's shoulder. What? he asked. It's Officer Bennett! Kate said. They know where Kevin is. Where? Peter said. Where? Kate asked. New York City, ma'am, Officer Bennett replied. He's wanted for unauthorized use of a credit card in the Plaza Hotel. What? Kate gasped. What? Peter gasped. He's wanted for unauthorized use of a credit card, Kate told her husband. Do they have him? She asked Officer Bennett. I'm afraid not, ma'am, he said. He ran away. Darn it, she muttered. We'll catch the next flight, Kate told Officer Bennett, and thank you so much for your help. She hung up and looked sadly at her husband. So we know he's in New York, by himself. I don't know whether to be thrilled or terrified. I wonder if he'd know enough to go to my brother's place, Peter said. Didn't you say they were in the middle of a major renovation? Kate asked. Peter nodded and sighed. You're right. The place probably isn't even inhabitable right now. Uncle Rob's house was on a dark side street about a block from Central Park. Kevin stopped in front of Uncle Rob's house and felt his heart sink. The building was dark and boarded up. The whole first floor was hidden behind a scaffolding. Kevin climbed the concrete steps and knocked. No one answered. He pressed his nose against the window and looked inside. The place was a wreck. The walls had been stripped away, leaving a wooden framework. The floors had been ripped up, too, the bare beams covered here and there with large flat sheets of plywood. Scattered around the plywood were ladders, workman's tools, coils of rope, bricks, and cans of paint and varnish. Kevin shivered and felt a little scared. 
It was hopeless. Kevin started back down a street called Central Park West. He came to a corner and saw several men in tattered coats sifting through garbage bins for soda cans. Kevin glanced nervously across the street to Central Park. It looked scary on that side of the street, but there might be fewer people, so when the light changed, he crossed. Kevin started to run. He didn't want to be in this cold, shadowy place with all these scary people. Suddenly he saw a cab parked at the curb. Hey, taxi! he shouted. A second later, he yanked open the door and jumped in. He slid into the back seat and tried to catch his breath. Boy, he gasped, it's scary out there. The cab driver slowly turned around. He had a pockmarked, unshaven face, a bent nose, cracked and bloodied lips, and eyes that were dull and cloudy. When he saw Kevin, he grinned, revealing pitted, discoloured teeth. Ain't much better in here, bud, he said. <coughs> Kevin screamed and jumped out of the cab. He ran into the park and followed a trail that led to a large mass of dark grey rock rising out of the ground. Kevin found a deep gap between two boulders and squeezed in between them. The walls of rock were cold and uninviting, but he'd finally found a quiet place where he could catch his breath and be alone. Opening the travel bag, he took out a bag of Doritos and tore it open. Boy, he thought, as he pressed a handful of corn chips into his mouth, I don't ever want to take a vacation like this again. A cooing sound startled him, and he turned to find a pigeon standing on the rock behind him. Kevin smiled. He broke off a piece of a Dorito and held it out to the bird. At least you're nicer than the people around here, Kevin said. But when he looked up again, there were now ten pigeons looking down at him from the top of the rock. Where'd you guys come from? Kevin asked, surprised. Then one pigeon started to rise from the rock. Something began to appear under the pigeon's feet. Filthy grey hair, a forehead, bushy eyebrows, then eyes. <coughs> Kevin jumped back. It was her. That crazy, disgusting pigeon lady. He turned and tried to run, but his foot got caught in a crack between the rocks. The pigeon lady was reaching toward him with filthy, gnarled fingers. What was she going to do? Kevin felt the pigeon lady's hand go around his ankle and push down gently until his foot was freed. Then she backed away. Suddenly, Kevin realized she hadn't meant him any harm. She'd only tried to help. Curiosity replaced his fright. I'm sorry I screamed in your face, he said. You were just trying to help me, right? The pigeon lady nodded and took another step back. Kevin could see she was really nervous. I'm Karen McAllister, he said. Your birds are real nice. The pigeon lady stared curiously. The pigeon lady blinked. Kevin wondered what she was thinking. Hey, if I'm bothering you, just tell me and I'll leave. She started to open her mouth. But at first, no words came out. Then she said, No. In a voice so small, Kevin could hardly hear it. You sure I'm not a pain? Kevin asked. The pigeon lady shook her head. Good. Kevin felt relieved. Then he became aware of a whole chorus of cooing birds. He looked up at the trees and saw the outlines of hundreds of pigeons on the bare branches. The pigeon lady reached into her pocket, took out a handful of seeds and put them in Kevin's hand, motioning him to throw them. Kevin threw the seed, and immediately the pigeons swarmed down and started pecking. Hey, that's great, Kevin said. A crooked little smile appeared on the pigeon lady's face. A chilly gust of wind blew past. Kevin shivered. It's pretty cold out, he said. I could sure go for a hot cup of chocolate. How about you? The pigeon lady gave him a puzzled, uncertain look. Maybe you prefer coffee, Kevin said. Either way, it's my treat. In a million years, Kevin couldn't have imagined the place where the pigeon lady wanted to drink her coffee. She led him up a fire escape alongside Radio City Music Hall. They climbed through a window and sat on a metal grating. As Kevin sipped his hot chocolate, he stared down at the stage below where a dozen ballerinas twirled to music played by the orchestra. I've heard that music before, Kevin said. 
It's the nutcracker, the pigeon lady said. It's nice, Kevin said. And warm, the pigeon lady added. Is this where you live? Kevin asked. No, she said. I have an apartment. Do you have any kids? The pigeon lady shook her head. I wanted them, but the man I loved fell out of love with me. Broke my heart. You might say I stopped twisting people. I was afraid of getting my heart broken again. The pigeon lady explained. I can sort of understand that. Kevin said, "I used to have this really nice pair of roller skates, and I was afraid that if I wore them, I'd wreck them. So I kept them in the box. And you know what happened?" The pigeon lady shook her head. "I outgrew them. I never got to use them." A person's feelings are a little different than skates," the pigeon lady said. "It's kind of the same thing," Kevin said. "If you aren't going to use your heart, if you just keep it to yourself." By the time you do decide to use it, it may not be any good. So why not take a chance? The pigeon lady nodded. Yeah, there's some truth to that. I think so," said Kevin. "Your heart may still be broken, but it's not gone. If it was gone, you wouldn't be this nice." The pigeon lady sighed. "I guess I was working pretty hard at keeping people away." I know what you mean," Kevin said. "I always think I'll have a lot of fun if I'm alone, but when there's no one around, it isn't fun at all. So why are you alone on Christmas Eve?" the pigeon lady asked. "Did you do something wrong?" "A lot of things," Kevin admitted. "Did you know that a good deed erases a bad deed?" "It's probably too late for that," Kevin said with a shrug. Why don't you think of the most important thing you can do for others right now, and go do it? Kevin wondered what that would be. He got up. I better go see what I can do, he said. But listen, if I don't see you again, I hope everything comes out all right. And say goodbye to your birds for me, okay? I will, the pigeon lady said. Merry Christmas, Kevin waved. And started to climb out the window to the fire escape. Back down on the dark sidewalk, Kevin tried to think of what he could do to help others. He walked along until he found himself at New York Children's Hospital. Kevin stared up at the windows decorated with blinking Christmas lights. Kevin felt a pang in his heart. It was sad to think of kids his own age cooped up in a hospital on Christmas Eve, too sick to be home with their families. Of all the good deeds he could do, Kevin wished he could do something for the kids in that hospital. Wait a minute. The bad guys were planning to rob Duncan's toy chest. Hadn't that white-haired guy said all the money in the store was going to this hospital? Kevin's eyes widened. The bad guys were going to steal the hospital's money. Kevin clenched his fists in anger. It was bad to mess with sick kids, but to do it on Christmas was inexcusable. Now he knew what his good deed had to be. He had to stop those guys from robbing the toy store. A little while later, Kevin was walking back up Central Park West. He knew he didn't stand a chance battling the bad guys in the street, but in a house, that was a different story. By the time he got to Uncle Rob's house, Kevin had started to formulate a plan. It would be called Operation. Ho ho ho! Shortly after the plane from Miami landed at LaGuardia Airport in New York, a convoy of yellow cabs pulled up in front of the Plaza Hotel, and the McAllisters jumped out. Kate went to the concierge's desk, red-faced and furious. On the other side of the desk stood the concierge and Ms. Acevedo, the clerk who checked Kevin into the hotel. What kind of a hotel lets a child check in alone? Kate demanded. What the boy had a convincing story, credit card, and a reservation. Ms. Acevedo stammered. Kate glared at the clerk in disbelief, and then turned to the concierge. What kind of idiots do you have working for you? The concierge swallowed. The finest in New York City, ma'am. 
It's Christmas Eve, Kate hissed. And because of you, my son is lost in one of the biggest cities in the world. I'm truly sorry, madam. The concierge apologized. You're going to be more than sorry, Peter said angrily. After we find our son, I suggest you prepare yourself for a civil suit. The concierge blanched. Sir, you must understand it was an innocent mistake. Uh, but in order to make it easier for you, we'd like to give you a complimentary suite here at the hotel for as long as it takes to find your son. Think you could make that two complimentary suites? Frank asked. I suppose we could give you an extra large suite, the concierge said. Sounds fair, said Frank. Kate turned to stare at the lights of the city and began to realize the enormity of the challenge that lay ahead. Somewhere, out there, helpless, lost and afraid, was her son. It would have stunned Kate to learn that her son was only a few blocks away at that moment, his face pressed against the window of Duncan's toy chest. On the sidewalk next to him was a plank of wood, a can of paint and a brick. Inside, on the second floor, Marv and Harry let themselves out of their playhouses. The store was dim and quiet. The two bad guys trotted down the unmoving escalator. On the first floor, they vaulted over the cashier's counter. Harry jammed his crowbar into a cash register and started to pry it open. The cash drawer slid out, revealing thick wads of green currency. Look at all that moolah, Marv whispered. Must be Christmas, Harry winked happily. Marv quickly opened the next register. It, too, was filled with cash. Harry laughed as he dumped the bills into a green gym bag he'd taken from the sporting goods department. The amazing thing, said Marv, is we're fugitives from the law. We're up to our elbows in cash money, and there ain't nobody who knows about it. Outside on the sidewalk, Kevin turned the paint can on its side and laid the plank of wood across it, creating a teeter-totter. Then he took an envelope out of his pocket. On it, he'd written, To Mr. Duncan, the guy who owns this store. Inside was a special message. Using a rubber band, he wrapped the envelope around the brick. Kevin looked through the window and watched as Harry and Marv gathered up all the money that was supposed to go to the kids at the children's hospital. This is it, he thought. There's no turning back. Another Christmas in the trenches. He knocked on the window. Inside, Harry and Marv looked up. They stared in disbelief. He's back, Marv gasped. They watched in frozen horror as Kevin took the Polaroid camera out of his father's travel bag and focused it. Before Harry and Marv had a chance to react, Kevin had taken a picture of them, hands full of cash, standing in front of a broken cash register. Through the window, they watched Kevin remove the photo and stick it in the travel bag. He took our picture, Harry groaned. But Kevin wasn't finished. He picked up the brick and threw it. The whole window shattered into tiny chunks of glass. A symphony of burglar alarms went off. Kevin backed a safe distance away down the sidewalk. We gotta get out of here, Harry shouted, grabbing the gym bag filled with money. He vaulted over the window display and jumped through the open space where the window had been. He landed on the wooden plank, slamming one end of it to the sidewalk. A second later, Marv sailed through the window and landed on the high end of the plank, catapulting Harry into the air. Marv looked around for his partner. Harry? Harry hit the sidewalk on his back and lay there, dazed. As Marv helped him up, there was another flash from Kevin's camera. He took another picture! Marv yelled. We gotta get him! Harry shouted. Kevin started to run. In the distance, police sirens began to wail as they responded to the burglar alarms. Looking back, Kevin saw the bad guys chasing him. If he couldn't beat them to Uncle Rob's house, he was dead meat. As Kevin ran down the sidewalk toward his Uncle Rob's house, he could hear Harry and Marv huffing and puffing behind him. He quickly hopped into a dumpster and crawled up the refuse chute to the third floor, then climbed one more set of stairs to the flat asphalt roof. He ran to the edge of the building and looked down. On the street below, Harry and Marv stopped 
and gasped for breath. Where is he? <sighs> Harry wheezed, looking around. <sighs> I don't know, <sighs> Marv replied, panting. I'm up here, you jerks! Kevin waved down from the roof. Come and get me! Let's kill! Marv growled. He started toward the steps to the brownstone. Hold on, pea brain! Harry grabbed him by the collar. Don't you remember we got busted last time because we underestimated that little bundle of misery? This ain't like the last time, Harry, Marv replied. This ain't his house. He ain't got a plan. Harry rolled his eyes. May I do the thinking, please? He looked back up at Kevin. Sonny, nothing would thrill me more than to shoot you. You understand? Kevin stared down without answering. But here's the deal, Harry continued. Why don't you just throw down your camera, okay? We won't hurt you, and you'll never see us again. Sound good? Promise? Kevin asked. Cross my heart, Harry said. Okay. Kevin picked up a brick and launched it. <clears throat> it smashed Marv uh. on the head. Kevin smiled. Direct hit. Marv was lying on the sidewalk, knocked out. Harry looked down at his unconscious partner. Don't worry, Marv. The kid's dead. Nobody throws bricks at me and gets away with it. Leaving Marv to recover, Harry sneaked down an alley behind the brownstone. He climbed up on a dumpster to reach the fire escape. Harry crouched down, then sprang forward. His hands went around the bottom rung of the fire escape, but Kevin had greased it. Harry went down. Ah! Harry hit the ground, flat on his back. Marv staggered up the front steps and tried to open the door, but the knob came off in his hands. There was a string attached to the knob. Marv pulled on it. The string was connected to a staple gun aimed through the keyhole. Marv screamed and grabbed his rear end. He had just stapled his pants to his behind. As he spun around, the string went tight again. Marv caught three more staples in the hip and doubled over in agony. The last three staples stapled Marv's hat to his head. In the back, Harry slowly rose to his feet and stepped onto the back porch. He tried the rear door, but the knob spun loosely in his hand. He gave the door a ferocious <coughs> kick. Kevin had tied a cord from the top of the door to the zipper of a plumber's bag hanging upside down over the porch. When the door flew back, it pulled the zipper open. <coughs> a dozen heavy iron wrenches crashed down on Harry's head. Marv grabbed his hat with both hands and pulled. The hat came off, along with several pieces of pink scalp. That's it! Marv shouted. I'm coming in! <laughs> Marv hit the front door with his shoulder and he flew into the house. Kevin had pulled away the plywood on the floor and Marv fell straight down into the basement. He hit the floor and laid there for a moment, then rose to his feet and promptly fell again. He gave the floor a closer look. It was glistening. The kid must have spread some kind of liquid soap on the ground. Marv spotted a large paint cabinet a few feet away. Slipping and sliding, Marv managed to grab the edge of the cabinet. Suddenly, it started to tip. A dozen open paint cans crashed down, knocking him to the floor. Marv staggered to his feet, drenched with thick, gooey paint. Groping for something to wipe his eyes with, he found a piece of cloth and pressed it against his face. But it wouldn't come off. The kid must have put glue on the cloth. Marv yanked it in frustration. Yeah! Marv looked down at the cloth and gasped. Staring back at him from the cloth were his eyebrows, moustache and goatee. On the back porch, Harry crawled out from under the pile of wrenches. He limped into the dark house and felt his way through the hallway. He stepped into a small bathroom. He saw a light string and pulled it. A light went on. Harry felt his head growing hot. He looked up at the ceiling into the blue flame of a butane torch. His hat was on fire. 
Harry twisted the water knobs on the sink, but no water came out. His head was burning up. Looking around desperately, he saw the toilet. What choice did he have? Harry dunked his flaming head. The toilet bowl erupted in flames. Harry straightened up and stared at himself in the mirror. Smoke rose from his head. The kid had filled the toilet bowl with paint thinner. Drenched to the bone, Marv looked for a way out of the basement. He saw a rope hanging down from the first floor. He gave it a little tug, but nothing happened. Filled with hope, Marv grabbed the rope and started to pull himself up. Suddenly, the rope came loose. Marv looked up, just in time, to see a 75-pound bag of plaster hurtling down through the beams. <sighs> the bag hit Marv on the head and drove him to the basement floor. Marv pushed himself up. The white powder had stuck to the wet paint, making him look like a snowman. He was going to murder that kid. On the first floor, Kevin stood and listened. Things were going just as planned. But now it was time to draw the bad guys upstairs. He shouted, Don't you guys know that a kid always wins against two idiots? Harry heard Kevin and dashed out of the bathroom. Marv threw a rope over the beams and started to pull himself out of the basement. Kevin quickly scrambled up a ladder leading through a hole in the living room ceiling. Harry ran to the ladder to follow Kevin up. He didn't know that Kevin had sawed the ladder halfway through. Just as Harry reached the ceiling, the ladder broke in two. Then Harry and the ladder slammed to the living room floor. Marv ran in and found his partner lying on the floor. Kevin leaned over the hole in the ceiling and waved down. Hey guys, why don't you try the stairs? Harry and Marv ran out of the room. Marv was just about to run up the stairs when Harry grabbed his arm. Hold on, he whispered. Don't you remember what happened last time? Marv thought for a second. Oh yeah, the paint cans tied to the ropes. Right, now watch. Harry stamped his feet as if he were going up the stairs. A second later, a paint can tied to a rope swung down the staircase. Ow! Harry shouted, pretending it had hit him. That's one, he whispered. Marv chuckled, then stamped his feet, shouting, Don't worry, Harry, I'll get him! A second can swung down. Oh! Marv shouted. Then he whispered, That's two! Now he thinks we've both been clocked! Harry whispered. Let's go! They started to run up the stairs. At the top, Kevin waited, holding a four-foot length of iron sewage pipe over his head. Harry and Marv froze. Kevin swung the pipe down. Ah! The bad guys shouted in unison. The pipe hit them. They both tumbled backwards down the stairs. They fell through the open floor beams and into the basement. Marv opened his eyes. That's three, he groaned. Kevin dropped the pipe and it banged down the stairs and teetered on the edge of the beam over the basement. It rolled off. Both bad guys crashed to the basement floor again with the pipe resting on their chests. That's four, Marv said groggily. Kevin ran up the stairs to the roof, where he'd left a long coil of rope soaking in a bucket of kerosene. One end of the rope was tied around a 100-pound bag of cement. Kevin pulled on a pair of work gloves and threw the rest of the rope over the side of the building. Then he carefully lowered himself down the rope to the scaffolding beside the first floor. Harry and Marv climbed out of the basement and up the stairs. I don't care if I get the chair. Harry swore as he lugged the green gym bag filled with cash. I'm gonna kill that kid. If we catch him, Marv said. We'll catch him, Harry said. He's on the roof. Where's he gonna go? They reached the top of the stairs and kicked open the roof door. Surrender, kid, Harry shouted as they stepped out. I don't see him, Harry, Marv said. I'm down here, you morons. Kevin shouted from below. Harry and Marv ran to the edge of the roof and looked down. Kevin waved and yelled. Nice night for a neck injury. Let's 
Get him! Marv shouted. Harry slapped him on the head. Are you nuts? That's exactly what he wants us to do. Look. He pointed to the bag of cement. It'll hold the kid. It ain't gonna hold us. We'll just have to disappoint the little creep. Harry untied the rope from the bag and knotted it securely around a vent pipe. Then he started to lower himself down the rope. Harry, you're a genius, Marv said as he followed his partner over the side. Kevin watched from two stories below. This is gonna be good, he thought as he struck a kitchen match against the brick. He held the brightly glowing match to the bottom of the rope. Merry Christmas, guys! Harry watched in horror as the bottom of the kerosene-soaked rope burst into flames. Instantly, Marv and Harry started wriggling upward, but the flames were faster than the bad guys. On the scaffolding, Kevin quickly checked to make sure the planks of wood and open cans of varnish were in position for the final bombing. Then he grabbed his father's brown travel bag, jumped down to the sidewalk and ran toward the park. A second later, Kevin heard screams as Marv and Harry let go of the burning rope and crashed through the loose wooden planks of the scaffolding, catapulting the pails of varnish high into the air. The varnish poured down over them. Then they were each smashed on the head with an empty varnish can. At the corner opposite the park, Kevin ran up to a payphone and quickly punched 911. The most dangerous part of Operation Ho 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 was about to begin. 911, an operator answered. Quick, Kevin gasped. The two guys who robbed Duncan's toy chest are in Central Park at 96th Street. Hurry, they've got a gun. Kevin hung up and looked down the block. Marv and Harry had just crawled out of the garden in front of Uncle Rob's house. Hey, I'm down here, Kevin yelled. As the bad guy started running toward him, Kevin crossed the street. He jumped onto the sidewalk, but slipped and fell on some ice. The travel bag flew a dozen feet away. He had to get the bag. Inside were the photos of the bad guys in Duncan's toy chest and the tape Kevin had made of Marv discussing the plans for the robbery. Kevin scrambled over the ice, reached the bag and grabbed it. Then he felt a hand yank him back. The next thing Kevin knew, he was staring at Harry's bruised and swollen face. Let's go for a stroll, kid. Harry started to drag Kevin into the park, Marv following behind. A few moments later, near the same rocks where Kevin had hidden earlier that night, Harry slammed him to the ground and ripped the bag out of his hands. He opened it and dug out the Polaroids and slipped them into the green gym bag filled with cash. He took out the talk boy and pressed play. Marv's voice came out. At midnight tonight, we're hitting Duncan's toy chest. Harry glared at his partner. Didn't I tell you to keep your mouth shut? He put the talk boy into the gym bag. Harry grabbed Kevin and yanked him up. You oughtn't to mess around with us, pal. We can be dangerous. Kicking his feet helplessly in the air, Kevin suddenly saw something that made him stop struggling. Harry had taken out a gun. Kevin was so scared, he didn't notice that the trees around him were starting to fill up with pigeons. But Marv did. Uh, Harry? Shut up! Harry snapped. Kevin stared straight down the barrel of the gun. Um, maybe we better get out of here, Marv said nervously. I said, shut up! Harry growled. Harry cocked the gun. Kevin closed his eyes and held his breath. Suddenly, someone said, Let him go! Kevin felt Harry's grip on his neck loosen. He opened his eyes. The pigeon lady was standing behind the bad guys with a bucket in her hands. She swung the bucket, showering them with bird seed. Most of it stuck to the varnish, making the bad guys look like two giant bird treats. The huge flock of hungry pigeons attacked. Harry and Marv screamed and dove to the ground. In an instant, they were covered by an army of pecking pigeons. Police cars with lights flashing now poured into the park and screeched to a halt. A dozen policemen jumped out and surrounded the two bad guys who were almost invisible beneath the swirling mound of pigeons. One of the cops raised his gun and fired.
In an instant, the startled pigeons were aloft, leaving the two terrified bad guys trembling on the ground. They staggered to their feet, covered from head to foot with pigeon feathers. Look at this! A cop had found the green gym bag. Inside was the stolen money, the photos, and the cassette of Marv planning the crime. Kevin watched as Marv and Harry were handcuffed and read their rights. A cop shoved Harry into the back of the squad car. As Marv bent down to follow him into the car, he said to the cop, My partner's still a little cranky. We just broke out of jail a few days ago. The cop pushed Marv in beside Harry. Suddenly there was a loud thumping sound and Marv yelped in pain. Then the door slammed. From his perch on a nearby rock, Kevin smiled. Operation Ho 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 was a complete success. He was just about to thank the police when he remembered that he was still wanted for credit card fraud. Maybe it was better if he just slipped away in the dark. In the extra-large suite at the plaza, Kate sat by the window, wondering where her little boy was. Her other children were sprawled asleep around her. Peter was slumped in a chair, snoring. Kate sighed. It was almost midnight, and she felt helpless and very, very sad. Not far away, Kevin wandered along the dark, cold, empty streets, feeling the same way. For a while, he'd felt really good about helping to capture the bad guys, but now he once again felt like a lost kid in New York. Outside St. Patrick's Cathedral, he stopped and looked up as the bells rang in Christmas. He could hear the choir singing Joy to the World, but there was no joy in Kevin's world tonight. He bent his head down and kept walking. In the hotel room, Kate turned a page of the magazine she was reading and stared down at a photo of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. She'd always wanted Kevin to see it. Then, suddenly, she had the oddest feeling. Kevin also had an odd feeling, as if he were being drawn somewhere. He crossed Fifth Avenue, went around a corner, and found himself staring up at the biggest, most beautiful Christmas tree he'd ever seen. He gazed sadly at the huge five-pointed gold star at the top of the tree. I don't want any presents, he said to himself. All I want is to take back every mean thing I ever said to my family. Even if they don't take back the things they said to me. I don't care. I love all of them. Even Buzz. As the church bells rang in the distance, he said, Listen, could I just see my mother? I just want my mother. I know I won't see her tonight, but just promise me I can see her again sometime, anytime, even if it's just once for only a couple of minutes, because I need to tell her I'm sorry. Kevin waited for a moment, as if hoping that by some miracle his wish would come true, but even he was old enough to know it wouldn't. Kevin slowly turned around. Standing 50 feet from him, was a woman who looked an awful lot like his mother. It couldn't be, could it? Mom? He gasped in a hoarse whisper. Kate turned, then rushed to her son. She felt the tears roll down her cheeks. Merry Christmas, sweetheart. Kevin looked at the tree in amazement. Wow, he thought. That worked fast. Kate hugged him tightly. How did you know I was here? Kevin asked. I know you and Christmas trees, Kate said. I guess this is the biggest one around, huh? Kevin said. Kate smiled. Let's go tell Dad you're all right. Where's everyone else? Kevin asked. At the hotel, Kate said, sliding her arm around his shoulder. They're in New York? Kevin gasped. Kate smiled. They didn't like the palm trees either. E.F. Duncan stood on the sidewalk outside his store, his wife beside him. Inside, a team of evidence specialists combed through the store, looking for clues to the crime. Suddenly, a police car pulled up and a cop jumped out. It's all over, Mr. Duncan, he said. Duncan frowned. What do you mean? We apprehended the thieves and recovered your money. Mr. Duncan's jaw dropped 
and his wife squeezed his arm with delight. Then one of the detectives approached, carrying a brick and an envelope. Excuse me, uh, are you Mr. Duncan? Yes, Mr. Duncan said, surprised. We found this inside. Looks like a kid broke your window. Mr. Duncan tore open the envelope and found a letter written on a sheet of Plaza Hotel stationery. Dear Mr. Duncan, I broke your window to catch the bad guys. I'm sorry. Do you have insurance? If you don't, I'll send you some money if I ever get back to Chicago. Merry Christmas, Kevin McAllister. Mrs. Duncan tugged on her husband's coat sleeve. What is it, dear? E.F. Duncan just smiled and said, Turtle doves. The sky was grey at dawn. Up in the McAllister's suite, Kevin slept in a double bed. Fuller jumped out of bed and started yelling, Wake up, everyone, it's Christmas! All around, Kevin could hear people grumbling as Fuller woke them up. Suddenly, he heard gasps coming from the foyer of the suite. Curious, he got out of bed and went to look. He found himself staring at a beautiful Christmas tree, surrounded by more gifts than he'd ever seen. Wow! Kevin gasped. Everyone waded into the sea of gifts and started tearing open the presents. Suddenly, Buzz raised his arms and shouted, Stop! Everyone turned and stared at him. Listen, Buzz said. If Kevin hadn't screwed things up so bad again, we wouldn't be in this most perfect and huge hotel room with a truckload of free stuff. So it's only fair that he gets to open the first present. Then I'll go, and then the rest of you. Buzz bent down and picked up a big box and handed it to Kevin. Merry Christmas, Kev. Everyone started to applaud. Kevin took a bow and then started to open his present. But something didn't feel right. Suddenly, he realized what it was and ran back to the bedroom. He found his coat and felt the pockets. The turtle doves Mr. Duncan had given him were still there. A little while later, Kevin walked into Central Park. Ahead, he saw the pigeon lady tossing seed to a hundred hungry pigeons on the ground around her. Merry Christmas! Kevin waved at her. The pigeon lady scowled, then smiled. Merry Christmas, Kevin! Kevin stepped through the sea of birds, then took her dirty hand and put one of the turtle doves in it. The pigeon lady looked confused, so Kevin showed her his turtle dove. Now I have one, and you have one, he explained. As long as we each have a turtle dove, we're friends forever. The pigeon lady blinked. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin gave her a hug. I won't forget you. Trust me. I do, the pigeon lady said with a big smile. Kevin smiled back. Everything had worked out great. The kids at the children's hospital would get their money. His family got all those presents from Mr. Duncan. The pigeon lady now had someone she could trust. And as for Kevin, well, he didn't really need to get anything, except for the satisfaction of knowing that after all was said and done, it really was the thought that counts. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation from Harper Audio. To order other titles or for a complete catalog, please call us at 1-800-331-3761. That's 1-800-331-3761. Thank you.